It takes a lot of nerve to have nothing at your age. Don't you understand that? Yeah, most guys would be ashamed, but you've got the guts to just say the hell with it. You say that you'd rather have nothing than settle for less. You understand? I never thought of it that way. Yeah. If you've heard of the legacy of the movie Ishtar, but not seen it, especially if you haven't seen it because of its reputation as a terrible film, congratulations. You are the victim of the 1980s equivalent of a studio review bombing its own movie. Basically, the system tried to kill Ishtar without giving it a chance. And while I'm not going to make the case that it's the greatest comedy of all time, it's definitely not the film you've heard about, and the vast majority of people you've heard mention it as a meme or synonym for a terrible movie haven't seen it, and most likely haven't tried to see it. Ishtar was comedian, actress, and writer Elaine May's third time out directing a feature film, and it was because of the behind-the-scenes mess that this movie turned out to be that it also ended up unceremoniously being her last. It was the film that destroyed her career as a director long before any general audience had seen a minute of it. There are many reasons for the behind-the-scenes mess and the bad word of mouth about the production, not the least of which were creative differences and budget overruns, leading to an overall chaotic production of the movie. All of these things started to slowly press a dagger into the heart of Ishtar before it had even started coming together. However, let's face it, these days lots of movies have those harried panics all the way up until release and then go on to be beloved by audiences and or critics, even some blockbusters. However, in the late 1980s, not many, if any, films had ever overcome that kind of pre-release rumor mongering when there was a woman in the director's chair. The Hollywood Boys Club that still exists today was still in full force in the 1980s, and even though Elaine May had two well-received films before Ishtar, and was a long-standing and well-respected entertainer up to that point, there was not going to be any coming back from this for her. Most critics and media had made their mind up before seeing Ishtar. And it didn't help that behind the scenes, the new head of Columbia Pictures, David Putnam, refused to promote the film and openly said the movie wasn't his and he never planned to see it. Even though early test screenings of Ishtar went exceedingly well and far above expectations. Ultimately, what we got was a film that released with an undeserved reputation that, according to longtime television and film producer Julian Schlossberg, had many prominent critics at the time reviewing, quote, the budget rather than the film. So, I beg you to put all that aside and consider the film Ishtar for what it really is, a dry-witted but often brutally odd and funny film with some out-of-the-box quirky performances by stars Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty. Now, I was in high school when Ishtar came out, and I wanted to see it, but I didn't because I fell victim to the Hollywood anti-hype assassins. It wasn't until Ishtar hit VHS not too long after it left theaters as a resounding flop that I decided to rent it, mainly because of some rumblings from people I respected, saying that it just wasn't as bad as everyone said it was. In fact, that it was, dare they say it, pretty funny. So I took it home one night on a three-day rental and plugged it in and watched it. And I watched it again. And then I watched it a third time. I was gobsmacked. As a 16-year-old kid who was just in the infancy of my transition from someone who just watched movies to someone that was beginning to appreciate the art of filmmaking, I loved Ishtar. I still love Ishtar today, despite its many flaws. Ishtar is a throwback to the Bing Crosby and Bob Hope buddy road comedies. It was a genre of film that Hope and Crosby pioneered and had been staggeringly popular for a long period of time. Hope and Crosby, along with Dorothy L'Amour, made seven of these pictures. 
Beatty and Hoffman were already two Hollywood megastars by the mid-1980s, and many people had been quietly buzzing about wanting to see them work together for a while. And reviving the road pictures seemed to be an excellent way to make this happen. Elaine May's script seemed like a perfect fit. In fact, the original title was The Road to Ishtar. But Warren Beatty wanted to avoid audiences drawing a direct comparison to Bob Hope and Bing Crosby, while Elaine May felt that this is exactly what it should do. After all, who had more clout to pull it off in the 1980s than superstars Hoffman and Beatty, whose stars were shining as bright, if not brighter, than Hope and Crosby's ever did? So, uh, what are you doing here, Jimmy? I went to CIA. Interesting work? It's okay. It's a little rough right now because the communists are trying to instigate a coup against the Amir and take over Ishtar. I'm going to be blunt. This film got unfairly fucked before anyone ever saw it. Had this been a lower budget film and or not starring two of Hollywood's hottest stars at the time, and or had it been directed by a man, I'm 100% convinced that this would at minimum be considered a cult classic today. And while it may not be for everybody, it's charmingly awkward and shows sides to both Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman we've never seen before. And they are great as two aspiring songwriters that are completely oblivious to their viciously low levels of talent. It also has a howlingly funny supporting performance from Charles Grodin. I would go so far as to say it ranks high in my list of Grodin's work, as he plays a CIA agent that ends up having to deal with these songwriters for batshit crazy political reasons. Did you know that in Ishtar, the dome of the Emir's palace is gold, and the people have never seen a refrigerator? Did you know that Gaddafi has signed a pact with Morocco? I can't believe these men may control the fate of the Middle East. The opening act of Ishtar explores how these two hapless songwriters, Lyle Rogers and Chuck Clark, played respectively by Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman, meet and start writing songs together in their spare time. And it does this in the form of a staggeringly adept series of montages and flashbacks intermingled with Hoffman and Beatty's characters writing songs. This is where much of the film's comedy comes from, as we see these two men, who have an astounding lack of self-awareness, write tune after tune of shallow, vapid, and crazy songs that they firmly believe within themselves are destined to be hits if they can just catch a break. They are so convinced that they are on the verge of making it big that they lose virtually everything in the process, including jobs, wives, girlfriends, and their life savings. So through Act 1, we embark on this sweet, odd series of scenes where these two men bond and become close friends. After they've lost pretty much everything, they use their last bit of money to hire an agent who books them on a Morocco gig for next to no money. On their way to Marrakesh for their gig, they have a brief stopover, where Hoffman's character inadvertently comes in contact with a woman who is a rebel separatist part of a movement challenging the Emir of Ishtar, a fictional Mideastern country somewhere on the Moroccan border. This separatist group is threatening to destabilize the entire Middle East by making public a recently found ancient map that seems to reference coming apocalyptic events. The U.S. government and the Emir of Ishtar both see this map as the possible spark that could ignite this Middle East powder keg. Charles Grodin plays the CIA agent who was tasked with operations to keep Ishtar stable, and recruits Hoffman's Chuck Clark to gather some basic intel for them, under the condition that he not speak to his partner about it. Later in Marrakesh, the same woman separatist that first made contact with Hoffman also makes contact with Beatty's character, Lyle Rogers, and also lets Beatty know that Hoffman is secretly working for the CIA. So now both Rogers and Clark begin to have to keep secrets from each other. And as their trust erodes away, it strains their relationship 
and throws what meager songwriting and performing career they have at the time into serious jeopardy. I'm not going to go into too much more detail other than to say there are a handful of things that make Ishtar worth seeing. Initially, Beatty and Hoffman are playing characters like you've not seen them play often, if ever. They are quite funny as well as believable as the two bumbling friends. Charles Grodin's CIA agent, who plays the pair against each other, steals every scene he's in and is ultimately the true villain of the piece. The songs Beatty and Hoffman's characters write together are mind-numbingly awful and just grin-inducingly on the verge, but not quite crossing the line of being too cringeworthy to watch them perform. She said, come look, there's a wardrobe of love in my eyes. Take your time, look around, and see if there's something your size. While there are many outright jokes and lots of just plain funny scenes in Ishtar, Most of the humor comes in the subtext and in the subtle nature of the characters. There is a jarring incongruity between the tragic and uncomfortable laughter we get from watching these two men fool themselves into thinking they have a chance in show business and some of the corny, more broad humor in the film. However, on the flip side, Ishtar is also a brutal satire of just how downright dirty the U.S. government can be, and this pulls no punches there. By the middle of the third act, basically every character in this film is trying to hunt down and or kill Hoffman and Beatty, including the U.S. government, and ultimately, Beatty and Hoffman are so self-absorbed in their own issues and delusions of stardom that they don't have the slightest idea why everyone is trying to get to them. By the end, Ishtar manages to lay out the intrigue, double-crossing, and nuanced complexity of the plot while not being confusing, even for a movie, that feels kind of ham-fistedly edited. The other thing working against Ishtar is that it is a mid-1980s $50 million film that doesn't really look or feel like a $50 million film. By today's standards, that pans out to be about a $120 million budget. This feels more like a quaint little heartwarming comedy, not the big-budget superstar blowout that it was planned to be. And I'm sure a good chunk of the awkward construction of Ishtar was caused in the editing room, as Columbia Pictures surely wanted to keep this film short and to the point, planning on it to flop. Now, if you're not expecting anything more than to laugh and really get attached to these foolish characters for an hour and a half or so, this movie is going to fill the bill just fine. It's by no means the debacle that you've heard about, and there's so much good in this film that it deserves to be remembered it certainly in no way should have tanked Elaine May's career. So that's really all I have to say about Ishtar. It's a film that deserves to have its defenders. I refuse to call myself an Ishtar apologist because there's nothing to apologize for in this funny and entertaining comedy that nobody should be afraid to seek out. So my final take is don't listen to anyone about Ishtar at least if they haven't bothered to see it for themselves. Judge it for yourself for what it is. As long as I'm drawing breath and watching movies, my Ishtar Blu-ray will be in my rotation to watch on a fairly regular basis. And you might be surprised how good it is should you ever decide to check it out. Love it or hate it, my recommendation is to decide for yourself rather than taking the word of a gaggle of people that decided it was going to be bad long before it was ever even finished being made.